Hi, I'm Eric Gosh. I'm with the National Health Council. I'm here to talk about um, provisions of the 21st Century Cures called dormant therapies. Um, first, a little bit about the National Health Council. Uh, we were founded in 1920 as a trade association for patient advocacy organizations. Um, so you see here um, a snapshot of the members that we currently have, um, really running the range from large groups such as heart cancer, diabetes, all the way down to rare disease groups. Um, and really running the, uh, the spectrum of different types of conditions as well. Um, in the 60s, we did two things. One, we started doing public policy, uh, primarily at that point, uh, just funding for NIH. Um, we also opened up membership to the other member types that you see here. So we have other nonprofits such as family caregiving groups, we have uh, business and industry, provider groups, insurance companies, really the entire spectrum of the healthcare community. And while we allow for um, all of our members to have input in our process, it's ultimately the patient groups who control our governance and really drive our public policy agenda. Uh, our mission is to provide a united voice for people with chronic diseases and disabilities. And everything we do is systemic in nature. We don't do anything condition specific. Uh, we allow our patient groups to do that work on behalf of their patients. Um, so one of the things that uh, we've been working on for quite some time now um, this came to us uh, from the chief medical officers of the patient groups had a meeting at the National Health Council. And um, this chart right here kind of came to our attention. And this was just after we had um, finished advocating to double the funding of NIH. Um, and you'll see here um, the NIH uh, makes up the, uh, the blue box there. But you see <clears throat> over the same period you saw uh, investment in biomedical research and other sectors increasing as well. And so I think naively as patient advocates, we thought that if we double the funding um, of research, we'd get double the treatments. What you see here in this gray line zigzagging down is that that number of FDA approvals remain largely stagnant. Um, if you look at more recent data, um, we start to see a little bit of an uptick in FDA approvals, uh, but still uh, nowhere near where the uh, chief medical officers want us to be. So they asked us to look at what were some other barriers besides uh, basic research funding that were preventing us from getting more treatments to market. Um, and we looked at a whole bunch of them. Uh, we were looking at uh, both treatments and diagnostics. I know uh, when we talked about modern cures last year, we mentioned that there were uh, provisions around diagnostics, which I'm happy to say were, uh, were signed into law last year. And so now what we're really looking at are how to get new treatments to market and what is the impact that the patent system is having. And this is something that we saw was a huge burden on development. <clears throat> um, you see here, um, I'm sure many of you people are familiar with Addie and Cassie Hempel. Um, I don't know if Chris and Hugh were here, I didn't see them, no. Um, so a lot of you know Chris and Hugh, um, who had, um, and I want to congratulate them, I know they had some recent success at FDA, but they uh, have been trying to get a, a product developed that uh, just does not have patent protection. Um, this happens for a lot of reasons in a lot of cases. I won't get into the technical requirements of patents, but I'll just say that they really have nothing to do with the medical merit of a product. Something can have a strong patent and fail during the research process. Something can be medically promising and not be eligible for a patent. There's no correlation between the two requirements, and we saw that this was a huge deal and that companies simply won't go and invest money to do the research if they don't think that they're gonna have strong patent protection. The other thing that we saw was an issue is the timeline. Um, as you heard uh, Carly say, uh, Francis Collins has said that it takes on average 14 years for a drug to be developed. Uh, the problem with relying on the patent system to protect medicines is that the research is done concurrently with the research or with the patent clock. So if something takes a longer time to get to market, it's going to have less time at the back end of, uh, of relevant patent protection, meaning their time to market exclusively. And so what this does is tells companies that what's most important for them in order to make as much money from their products as possible is to get something onto the market the fastest. And this is not really where most of the unmet medical need is. Things that are more complicated or they're conditions that we don't know a lot about how they work, we don't know how to develop drugs to treat them, are gonna, simply gonna take longer to research and to develop. 
Um, if you want to show that you can slow the progression of a disease or prevent a disease, you might need to do something like a 10, 15 year clinical trial, but you're not going to do that type of work if it means that you're not going to have any patent time left on at the end. Um, here is something that really proves this theory in action. This was a uh, study that was done by professors from uh, Harvard, MIT, Chicago. And they looked at about 50,000 um, clinical trials that were done for uh, cancer products. And they wanted to see where all of these fell into the spectrum of, of different stages of cancer. And what they saw is that in these 50,000 trials that date back to 1974, I believe, of 50,000, only 500 were done to show that they prevented cancer. Um, and very few of them were done in early stage cancers. Most of them were done in late stage cancers because you can do a, click, a quick clinical trial. If you want to show that you can extend someone's life by a year, you only need to do a one year clinical trial. If you want to show that it's going to prevent it, it might take 10, 15 years and no one's going to do that because of the fact that a patent only runs for 20 years. So, you know, as patient advocates, we always understood that a company is not going to pursue a product either, you know, within, uh, within medicine or anywhere in industry. No one's gonna pursue a product without a patent, but I think that we always thought that if you have a great idea that's gonna uh, cure a rare disease, of course you'll get a patent, but that's not how it works. And we saw that um, the timing of it really didn't work out to drive companies in a place where we wanted them to. Um, so what did we do? Uh, we created a, a class of drugs called dormant therapies. Um, this is an optional pathway for companies. If they think that their uh, product that they're researching either has, a, has no or weak patents or they don't think that there'll be much left at the end of it, they can go into this pathway. And what it does is says, if something uh, it treats an unmet medical need um, that will be determined by the FDA, they'll be eligible for 15 years of protection from the date of FDA approval. From the date of FDA approval is a huge important key consideration here because it says that if you want to take, do something that's going to take longer to do the research on, you'll get the same amount of time from the time it goes onto the market, no matter how long that took. Uh, we know that there will be some demand. There is being debate about what that right period of protection is. Um, and you know, as the National Health Council, we haven't taken a stance on it. We know it certainly needs to be more than <clears throat> what is currently allowed. And again, as long as it's something that starts at the FDA, the date of FDA approval, that's going to mean that companies aren't gonna be penalized for taking longer to get something out of the market, and that's the, the most important part. Um, the other thing to mention is that companies will have to waive any patent rights they might have on sort of secondary or tertiary patents. So it sets a floor and a ceiling, it creates certainty for them, it creates certainty for generic companies to know when they can come onto the market, and again, really drives companies into a, a different place than they are right now. Um, just a little history, a uh, little legislative history here. Um, we know, I know I talked to you guys last year about the Modern Cures Act. Uh, that was in Congress for the last two years. Uh, we had 48 Republican, 47 Democratic co-sponsors, so about 100 um, split almost right down the middle, which is a, a rare thing in uh, Washington these days. Uh, I know Mr. Butterfield was on it, so thank you, Saul. I don't think Mr. McCall was, so we should talk about this. And, and, and we can talk some Dodger. And we can, what? Okay, well, and then thank you. And we, okay, then we can find some time to talk about Dodger baseball, because I'm also a Dodgers fan. <laughs> um, so it was introduced uh, late last year in the Senate as the Dormant Therapies Act by Senators Bennett and Hatch. Uh, we expect it to be uh, reintroduced in both chambers uh, with the same name around the same time uh, coming up soon. Um, so I would say that uh, one of the asks should be when you're on the Hill to uh, ask your senators uh, to contact Ben and Hatch's office to be your original co-sponsor. Um, in the House, ask your representatives to contact Mr. Lance to be original co-sponsor. Um, it is included in the 21st Century Cures package, um, but as Carly said, um, you know, these are things that they're still working out what will be in the final package. So certainly, um, if any of you uh, have representatives that are on energy and commerce, uh, make sure that you're uh, reaching out to them and asking them uh, to support its inclusion. Um, and finally, um, in the e-blast that was sent out by RDLA today, there is a sign-on letter that the National Health Council um, has, uh, has put together, and we're looking to have organizations sign on onto that as well. I think that the more patient groups we have supporting that, the more likely this will be to be enacted. 
Um, so thank you for your time, and I look forward to any questions you might have. Thank you.